we wouldn't have the cross if we didn't have the manger. And so I know we're getting, Danielle's got a great, um, great uh, Advent prepared for us. So we'll get into that. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Um, so happy first day of Advent. Um, we always look forward to that. I'm sorry my voice still sounds kind of funny, but um, I, I believe I'm on the downhill stretch of it. It's been like 12 days, 13 days, maybe. So um, otherwise I wouldn't be here like exposing everybody. But um, anyways, just be aware <laughs> if my voice may sound different or if I cough. But um, anyways, I hope everyone had a really happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we're going to be talking today about our Advent theme. And we're going to kind of open it up. I want to show you all. Um, there's actually an, a piece of art that goes with the theme. And um, whenever we're able to get that up on the screen, we will. And actually, Lauren already did it. So this piece of art is called The Light of the World. And a man named William um, Holman Hunt. Sorry, I was like, I know the middle name, not the last name. William Hunt did this piece. And um, even though he called it the light of the world, I always think of Revelation where he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, is what I think when I see this painting. But um, I chose this because our theme this Advent, this year, is Jesus, the door, our gift. So um, all, all month long on Sundays, we'll be talking about what aspect of the door that he is to us and our gift. And um, so I think that will keep making more sense as we go throughout the Sunday. It's why we chose that. But um, I want you all to notice that um, on this particular door, you don't see, um, a lot of people have commented on this, you don't see an outside uh, doorknob. You know, all you see is a flat door and him knocking. And that's because th that was on purpose. That was because only we can open the door, right? He can knock, he can be there, but only we can choose to open the door. And it just shows, um, you know, so that it's a really beautiful painting, actually. And uh, just to see him coming um, at the time of night, at twilight, coming to this overgrown door and what he wants to do in our lives. That makes me think of our past, just our uh, Cultivate to Harvest that we just came out of. But anyway, so that's what our theme is, Jesus, the door our gift. And today we're specifically going to, going to talk about the door of hope. And so Jesus is um, our, our door of hope. And, you know, if you think about doors, they are what allow us to access something. Um, they can actually be a, something that causes you to access your destiny. You talk about, you know, walking through a doorway of destiny. And we, we think of it too, they can be for exits. You know, when you're desperate to exit somewhere, too. So that's what Jesus is to us. He's our doorway of possibilities, our doorway of um, destiny. He's our doorway of escape from things as well. He is every single door that we need. But like I said today, we're going to talk about the door of hope. And so when we look at the arrival of Jesus, and remember, Advent means arrival. When we look at his arrival from his miraculous conception all the way to his birth in a manger, to his toddlerhood being worshipped as a king by the wise men, uh, we see that he was announced as king on several occasions. And so that's what we're going to start out talking about is these announcements of him as king. And I'll tie that into the door here in a minute. But um, the first announcement we have is the angel Gabriel, he announces to Mary that she, a virgin, will conceive when the Holy Spirit overshadows her. And so that was the first announcement we have, at least on the human side, of us finding out this is about to happen. This is the very first one. And, of course, Mary's the, the, the only audience member at that point, at least on, again, on earth. We know angels are attending the work of God all the time. But Gabriel is there. Can you imagine? There's... You know, she is the only person in history to have had that kind of honor bestowed upon her. And it really speaks of the way that God sees uh, womanhood, the way he sees motherhood, and how he so adores that position. 
God does. Because he could have chosen any way to send his son, Messiah, right? He could have. I mean, I don't know how other ways he would have done it, but, you know, he could have sent him as a full-grown man, just showed up one day, right? But he didn't. He, he sent him um, going through, um, speaking of doors, he went through so many doors to even get to us, to be who he is to us, but being the door. But he chose, God chose Mary, and there was a grace upon her life. And because even the angel Gabriel says, you know, you're highly favored, you know. Now, the reason I didn't use the term immaculate conception today is I was looking into it a little more. Um, immaculate in terms of being pure or unspotted, that is a totally great to call the immaculate conception. But as I was reading more, it's actually more connected, and I didn't know this, but more connected with maybe an understanding of Mary, um, in the, at least in the Catholic Church, of her having kind of no original sin and all this other stuff. And I realized that's not really the, what we can say about Mary, but what we can say, because she was human just like all of us, because only Jesus did not have sin in his life, but he was tempted, meaning he was the second Adam who had to show who he really was and overcome that. So I wouldn't, you know, so we wouldn't say Mary was was um, free of original sin or superhuman in any sense. She was very human, but she had the favor of God in her life. Amen. That means, and if Mary has that, you know, how much more can we have that? She was lowly, and God looked upon her humility towards Him, Himself, and chose her. So that so she's always going to be so. Um, special and set apart in that sense. I just want to differentiate those words. However, um, so we so we have her um, being chosen to carry, really to carry the king, and this announcement comes to her. Um, I also want to say, you know, Jesus, him fulfilling the second Adam spot, she fulfills, in a sense, a second Eve spot. Because... She takes upon herself by saying yes, saying to God, be it unto me as you've said. She takes upon herself really making the right choice. And so Adam and Eve in the garden made the wrong choice. You know, we see Eve actually having the first conversation with Satan. But we know Adam's not far away. He has to be standing there because he's immediately pulled into the situation. And they both decide to move forward in those decisions. But here we have it to where now we'll have a chance for a second Eve, Mary, to choose this powerful destiny. She chose something painful. She chose something incredible. But it was painful. And even Simeon said, a sword will pierce your heart. He was speaking of the kind of pain that she would have as the mother of Messiah, watching him give his life for all. But all that to say, so in this one moment, we have a second chance at the garden. Mary makes the right choice. We have the second chance at the garden. The second Adam, Jesus, who will perfectly do everything, is placed into her womb. So the Holy Spirit overshadows her. And this is what it says in Luke 1, 30-33. It says, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, a very great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So, that's that first announcement. Not only is the announcement itself um, amazing, but the fact that an angel has come to her in person to <laughs> speak with her and that it's one of the archangels. So these are all really, bi this is a huge announcement. So that's to Mary. Um, and then the next announcement I want us to look at, um, an angel announces to Joseph in a dream that he is to stay with Mary because Although they were, you know, engaged to be married, um, him finding out she was with child was something that 
you know, you would need to choose to go a separate ways, right? But an angel comes to him and announces to him to not be afraid. He says, this, this child within her womb is holy from God, and in, in essence, Mary is still pure. So in that sense, it is immaculate in that sense. The angel tells Joseph that she will have a son and they will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Why did that angel announce it that way? He was saying because the name Yeshua, Joshua, means salvation. So he's saying you'll name him salvation because he will save people from their sins. Next, we have the announcement, another, the, another big announcement in Jesus' birth. Because um, all of that was preceding his birth. That was during his time in the womb. But now at his birth, we have uh, the shepherds, you know, finding, finding out. I'm going to read it to you in Luke 2, 8 through 17. I'm just going to read the announcement. It says, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. So even as he's being born and he's fresh and he's there, we have another announcement. This announcement was huge. I mean, angels, host of angels lighting up the sky singing. I mean, that is a huge announcement. This goes from one-on-one -on -one with Gabriel, Gabriel and Mary, Joseph in a dream with an angel to now like at the heavens are actually singing and saying, hey, he's really here. Messiah is really here. And um, and so I just love the faith of the shepherds because they don't even which I would have a lot of faith, wouldn't you? If you just had an angel and then like choirs of angels tell you, you would need to have faith. But anyways, the point is they, they acted on the faith and they ran in there and they said, yes, that's that's him. They start telling everybody about it. So that's another announcement. And then some, a couple more announcements. Even when Jesus is brought into the temple to be presented to the Lord, because, you know, every male child um, in Judaism, you had to ha bring them and with the accompanying sacrifices. And so that's what they were doing, Mary and Joseph, after Jesus' birth. And both Simeon and Anna, a man of God that was looking for Messiah, Simeon, and then Anna, a prophetess, they both declare the Messiahship of Jesus this newborn baby. They both just say it. Those are other announcements. So literally every single moment you see people reiterating the announcement of him. Um, and then finally we have the wise men. They show up around the time that Jesus is about two, two years old, and they declare to Herod this. They say in Matthew 2, 1 through 2, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the well, I'm reading this to you. During the reign of King Herod, about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived at, in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. And again here in Matthew 2, 9 through 12, after this interview with Herod, the wise men went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So here we have kind of this last huge announcement 
So he's a toddler. Can you imagine? You know, we saw our, our little ones out here. And I wonder how, what Jesus, how he reacted. <laughs> I mean, I think we always think he was just like the solemn, perfect child. But he was a child. So maybe he was jumping around. Maybe he was like pointing at all the gifts. Maybe he was like yelling out in excitement. But these wise men bowed down. They worshipped him as king. And here the, they've given these gifts. And that it, in itself, was beyond the angels and what they did with the lighting up the sky, the wise men coming was one of the biggest announcements simply because of the amount of time they traveled and the gifts they brought to him. And the fact that their announcement is them saying, look, we followed the stars or even a star, even the heavens. And, you know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So even the heavens are lighting up, guiding them, announcing Jesus. So the announcements of Jesus' arrival as a newborn king, it was not this passive acknowledgement of something new beginning. It was the active heralding of a change in human history. It wasn't just like, because sometimes when we read, we just like read from one thing to the next. And it's like, oh, that happened and this happened and this happened. But these were standalone huge announcements being made. But when you put them all together, when you take them together, it's like this was beyond um, just a communication campaign. This was an announcement. This was actually saying, hey, Every single thing is about to change in your world. It was as if God had pulled back a bow, his bow, an arrow, and he had shot an arrow of love right into the middle of human history. And this arrow, Jesus, the Son of God, he would literally alter all of history as mankind had known it. And we, I like how people say he's actually Jesus, the one who separates time, right, B.C. and A.D., um, I know people have tried to make it, you know, different with BCE and uh, CE, where they'll say before common era, common era. I'm like, well, we still do before Christ, Christ and at his birth, at the birth of the Lord. <laughs> um, so he literally separates history. Um, but this arrow of Jesus would pierce through and shatter 400 years, and Pastor Sri made reference to this, 400 years of prophetic silence, meaning that the, that's why we, we sang O Come, O Come, o, um, Emmanuel today, because Jesus being the door of hope, you have to hold on to hope when things aren't happening a certain way. When things aren't going your way, you have to hold on to hope, right, for your personal life, for your communal life. Um, and the thing is, no new word had been given out over Israel. No new word had been, like, given from God to a prophet to his people. And so the people of Israel had just continued to live life waiting, hoping for Messiah, right? But just really hoping for a word about him even. Not even just him, but a word about him. So here, Jesus actually, that's what's cool. He shatters that 400, prophet, 400 years of prophetic silence, and he answers with a resounding shout. All of the longing for Messiah, from the Garden of Eden to Abraham to Moses to David to all the famed prophets, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, through to Malachi. So he shatters all that and says, I'm here. And you can understand why, if you were looking at all the signs, you would, even in the Isaiah passage that was read this morning, um, you would be looking for kind of a conqueror, right? You would be thinking, well, he's going to end this occupation of our land by Rome. He's going to end our pain. He's going to put a stop to war. Well, Everything in Isaiah is both now and later. That's the thing about prophecy. It's so often now and later. And you can only look back at it and get the full picture. They say hindsight's twenty twenty with prophecy. That's absolutely accurate that it's hindsight's twenty twenty, <laughs> right? Um, so here we have this passage in Isaiah. You can understand why they were looking for a king 
that would change everything. But what happened was Jesus was changing everything. He was bringing a spiritual kingdom that could not be overtaken. And he is also, and I'm saying this this way on purpose, and he is also literally in real time going to take all those blood-stained warrior clothes and let them burn and be fuel for the fire in the future. He will stop every war. He will place peace on this earth. When the new heavens and, and the new Jerusalem, and even before millennial reign, when his foot touches our land, he will make right what has been wrong, and wars will cease. So when people are like, I don't understand if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, why are there still wars? Because he is the Prince of Peace in our hearts. But he will be the Prince of Peace in a literal sense in the future. So he's both now and to come. Your salvation and mine is both now and to come. We have been saved by grace through faith now. But we will be saved more fully when we see him face to face in eternity. You cannot be more saved than being in his presence for all eternity. You are never going to be in any danger any longer. This is not a pie in the sky dream that Christians walk around believing. This is prophecy fulfilled and prophecy waiting to be fulfilled. If if we as believers didn't see all of this already happening in our lives where he is changing our lives and he's made our lives different, we could maybe doubt more of this book. But not only have we seen him work in our lives individually, we have seen how Jesus fulfilled all of these messianic promises in a staggering accuracy. And when he's done that, you can be sure that the rest of the ones that are waiting to be fulfilled will be. So that's why I mean it's not a pie in the sky. It's informed faith informed faith we're not just walking around hoping you know we're walking around hoping waiting hope is um it's mounted to something it's rooted in something it's not um i mean of course in our language we say i hope it doesn't rain today i hope it goes well today i hope the traffic's good today yeah okay but no we're talking about biblical hope that is something that god uses to anchor us in himself And that is why we're talking about Jesus being this door of hope. And so this newborn king found in a manger, he would be the door to hope for every burdened soul from the patriarchs of our faith all the way to you and to me. And he is not just a door of hope. He is the door of hope. This is what the, the scriptures I'm about to read to you are what everything is tied to all month long in Advent. And this is what it says in John 10, 7 through 10. This is Jesus all grown up, this mighty miracle man. This is what he says. Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. That's where we get this from. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So I tell you today, he, Jesus, is the door of hope for you and for me. So when he says, I am the door, in other versions, it it can also say, I am the gate. But he is saying, I am the door. It's another way of him saying, I am the way to what you need. He's saying, if you need to find good pasture, say, pasture, enter through me. Don't enter by another way. And he's even further in a deeper way saying, and not even just deeper, but really accurately explaining, there's no way to safety and salvation except through me as the door. He's saying, you can't enter another way. And the people who try to enter another way are thieves and robbers, right? They try to, and and that can be cast as several things in our lives and in our world. That can be, you know, all those things we talk about, the seeds that we talked about in the parable of four four soils, not seeds, the um, soil. That can be riches, cares of life that try to come in by another way. That can be um, new age religion, any other world religion that, you know, all these things, that um, philosophies that try to pull our minds and our hearts away from Jesus as 
the Messiah. Jesus Christ, his name, Jesus, you know, it, it's just Messiah is Christ. So when we say Jesus Christ, again, I know we've all talked about this, but it's not like Jesus, first name, surname, Christ. It's Jesus Christ, a title, Christ being Messiah. So that's why you'll hear um, a Jewish, you know, a Jewish person's talking about looking for Messiah. They'll use a Hebrew word, Mashiach. I'm not probably pronouncing that just right. But I mean, if, if somebody like us, when we're saying it, we're just saying it in English. Christ is the name for Messiah. So we're saying Jesus, we're saying Joshua, salvation, Messiah, Savior, and Lord. Okay? So we know him as both Savior and Lord, but we know him as this door that we can enter in through and find safety. So another thing that inspired this Advent theme to be very uh, vulnerable in front of you is that when I was seeking the Lord one day and just praying and I was um, meditating on the power of his his blood to save his people, and I was thinking about how each drop that he shed for us had infinite power in every drop. It's a powerful thought. Um, But just thinking of that, he suddenly gave me this really powerful picture. And it was kind of funny to me because it didn't have anything to do with the blood of Jesus, like in terms of very, like, specific but he suddenly gave me this picture, and I, I saw him, like an outline of him in front of me um, as I was praying. And suddenly, like, his, the, the middle of his chest swung open. It was like a door, and it swung open. And when it did, it was like I saw door after door opening like an infinity mirror. Boom, 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 boom. And it was like, getting faster and faster. This is a picture I had from the Lord. If anybody's like, wait, what? Was this a dream? No, it was just like a visual picture the Lord gave me. So it was like, boom, 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 boom. Door after door after door after door. And it was like kind of warp speed. Where like, you know, you think of space, you keep going faster until everything's kind of whooshing by you and all you see is right, what's right in front of you is door, 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 door. So it was a really amazing picture. And then I heard him say, I am every open door you will ever need. And the fact that that picture was going so fast with the same door opening upon itself, that infinity of doors opening, it was very powerful and it hit me so strong. And I, I know when he's giving that to me, I'm sharing that with you, that's for us. He's every open door that we will ever need. Every open door. So when he says, I am the door, he is saying, I am the way through you, through which you can go to get what you need. So anything you need today anything you need this week anything you need this month you can say Jesus I need this to work out I need your help with this I need your help with that you can cry out for the tiniest thing you can cry out for the largest miracle everything is the same to him miraculously healing someone's blinded eyes and then making a way for you with your job or your work are the same to him but not to us we're like, whoa. But to him, he's so powerful that he's just giving out of the overflow of who he is. So we're the ones who can't believe when something seems bigger or smaller. You know, we're like, oh, that's a big miracle. That's a, No, a miracle is a miracle. But the point is when he answers prayer, for him, he's just being who he is. He's being this door of hope, this door of provision. And so we can really lean into him on that. So again, we have to, um, excuse me, latch onto this, that he is the door of hope for us. And so when we walk through him, Jesus, into salvation by grace, we are immediately placed into a relationship and communion with God himself. And so Jesus is this door. We can just open and suddenly be in the presence of God. We can be with God our Father. If you think about it, it's also like the curtain temple, I'm mean, sorry, the temple curtain, that when that completely split, when Jesus was, be- when he died, that split open, that again, that was showing he was the door. It's because his flesh opened the door. His, his sacrificial uh, Lamb of God flesh, who he was, opened the door to the Most High God. And so, when we speak of him as a door of hope, we're saying he's the hope that there is salvation. 
he's the hope that it's not game over for us in any way. He's the hope that he is returning again. And he's the hope that we pray to and through Jesus is that door. You know, when we we're, we're continuing to pray for those that are captive, literal captives that are from Israel. And dad thought of that today. When we we're singing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. He was kind of, you know, touched with that, just that looking at those posters as we're, we're singing that song. And of course, that song is talking about the longing of Israel for Messiah. But it's also the longing of the, the church for the return of Christ, right? To make everything whole. Um, so it has many aspects you can connect with in that song, but it was hard not to connect that with these literal people who are captive. And so even as we're praying for them and many are continuing to come home, um, we can just believe for the hope of them coming home. And then for you in your life, you can ask Jesus to be your door of hope. If something feels completely dead in your life or completely like it's just not working, whatever, um, adjectives you would use to describe it. You can say, Jesus, I need you to be the door of hope for this. I need you to become that door of hope, and I need to be able to walk through you because this isn't working out on my in my way or what I thought would happen, and we need you to be the door of hope for us right now. And so I want you all to hold on to that. I want us to hold on to this for this week starting out Sunday, starting out our week, Advent, is to say, you know, I'm going to hold on to Jesus as my door of hope. And, and if you want to want to think about that further, just keep going back to John 10, 7 through 10, and realizing that he is the door and that he is going to take care of you. He's going to let you go in and out and find pasture. He's come to give you life and that more abundantly. He's come to give your family life and that more abundantly. Whatever touches you, he has come to make alive again and abundant in life. That's who he is, is this door of hope. And then when the enemy does try to still kill and destroy, come in another way, remember that Jesus, he is the great high shepherd that knows how to protect you, and you're in his flock. So he's not going to let you just ask him to help you. He'll raise up that standard of help for you and me. And so it's getting busy, you know, in December, things speed up, but it's good stuff, right? Yeah. Generally good stuff. Um, and so if, if there's anything going on just that wants to try to even steal your joy, I want you to go back to this and be like, no, I can have hope. Yeah. Jesus is with me. He's for me. I can ask him to help me right now. Yeah. I don't have to go back into any kind of despair I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear. I don't have to have stress. He is my door of hope. So that's that's what I want us to hold on, hold on to um, this week. And as I said, we're gonna see how, how many other ways He is the door for us, right? Um, but I want us to pray today, and I want us to pray for hope to be really dispersed more in us, in our hearts, and for us to understand just how. How, how real that hope is that he's given us. So I want to pray over us. And and then obviously if anyone has any um, specific prayer requests that they want to pray, pray with us for online or in person, we'll do that as well um, at the end here because uh, this is our prayer time. But let's, let's come into a time of prayer and letting the Lord minister to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you did send this arrow of love right in the middle of our um, very dark place. You sent light. You sent hope. You sent love. And Lord, I know and we know that there are people right now, they don't have this hope yet. So before I ask you for anything for us here, we want to raise our voices for those who need the hope of Messiah. So, Lord Jesus, those here in Tallahassee, in our own families, our friend groups that need the hope of who you are, Lord, let your spirit go to them, reveal yourself to them. 
grip their hearts. Bring them home to you, Lord. I thank you that you are such um, a mighty Savior that when you go to each person, it is so uh, personalized to them. And you talk to them in the way that they need to hear you. And I just thank you for that, Jesus. You're so good. You're so good, God. So, Lord, we just pray again, our, our smallest circle here, our friends and family group that need you, Jesus, that don't know you yet, let that hope come to them, we pray, even today. And then, Lord Jesus, we pray for our city, people all over this city that need to know you, Jesus, that their, the hope of you would come to them. And then all around our nation, God, those who are hurting and need to, again, see this door of hope. Lord, reveal yourself to them. And then to the globe, reveal yourself to every tribe, tongue, and nation. We know you will because that's what you desire, God, and that's what's written in your word. But we just pray your hope would be shed and abroad in people's hearts all over the world. And so then, Lord, we just want to praise you. Thank you for being the door of hope that we can access. We can actually open you into everything you've prepared for us. And Lord, I want to pray over your people today. Whatever place feels maybe really tired or weary or maybe sometimes feels dead or just feels like in a holding pattern, whatever could describe what any of your people are going through, I pray right now, God, that that hope of Jesus would blow life into those areas and come in and take doubt and take fear and take sadness and that hope would drill down into all of our hearts and would be this strong, um, like an oak tree, this strong tree that we can lean against, that is immovable, this hope in you, Jesus. I pray, God, that you would even do something new in our hearts today, any of us who need a new level of hope, Lord, that you would give us what we need, something new for us. So, Lord, I just want to pray, too, that as your people are thinking on you, uh, getting ready to celebrate your birth, Lord, I pray that you would be with them, Lord, in all of their errands, any provision they need. Lord, you know what your people need, so I'm just praying a blessing over them, a strong blessing over them by the power of Jesus. And I want to pray that the thief that wants to still kill and destroy would not be able to get into our hope, get into our joy, get into um, our hearts this season, but th there would just be a hedge about us and that we would be just strong in the joy that you've given us, Lord, through yourself and through this season. And Lord, let us be sensitive to those who really do need to hear a message of hope, who really do need practical um, things uh, in their lives to be supplied, God. So we just pray that. We thank you again, Lord, for who you are, Jesus, the announcement of who you are, the reality of who you are, and then who you have come to be for each one of us. And so, Lord, we bless your holy name, and we bless your people in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. And if anybody, again, if anybody needs um, further prayer online, if you have a need, you need to let us know, and we will pray for you. If you're in person and you want um personal prayer we're here so um, I'll give a moment for that but if you need to be dismissed you're totally dismissed we love you this Wednesday we'll be here at 6 30 and look forward to to being with everyone and